This is the Singapore that we all know. It's modern, futuristic, incredibly green, and home to some of our world's most impressive buildings, from airports to hotels and even floating Apple stores. But there's one thing you won't really find here. Farmland. Singapore currently imports 90% of its food supply. That means when something like, say, a global pandemic or geopolitical tensions disrupt the supply chain, being able to produce your own food within your own borders suddenly becomes really important. To make its food supply more resilient, the Singaporean government has laid out an ambitious goal – produce 30% of its own food by 2030. But unused land in Singapore is hard to come by, so urban farms are popping up inside, outside and everywhere in between. As the world's urban population continues to grow, these might just be the farms of the future, and construction will need to know how to build them. Today, Singapore's population is 100% urbanised, and traditional farmland makes up just 1% of the city's landmass. But it hasn't always been this way. Agriculture has never been a huge part of Singapore's economy. In the 1960s, it accounted for around 4% of GDP. But as Singapore continued to invest in urban development, economic focus shifted away from farming and towards manufacturing. And by the early 2000s, agriculture's role in Singapore's economy was almost non-existent. We have lost um, probably um, generations of knowledge and also participation uh, in, in food production uh, in, in, our, in our country. Uh, so I wanted to see what I could do to sort of reignite that a little bit. That's Bjorn Lowe, a digital marketer turned urban farmer who co-founded Edible Garden City. We have built 260 um, edible gardens in Singapore, whether it's for homes, um, hotels, restaurants, um, on top of shopping malls, uh, at sc in schools, uh, and then in a lot of uh, various underutilised land around the city. Over the last decade, Bjorn has seen the sector shift from being led by smaller farmers like himself to getting major government and industry investment. So you have a lot of big commercial players coming in, um, whether it's from the fish farms or the egg farms, you know, we, you have uh, technology providers coming from Holland, uh, from Japan, uh, wanting to use Singapore as, as a platform, as, as a launch pad for, for their technology. It has um, become a well-oiled ecosystem or almost an ecosystem um, at, at this point. In a sense, the groundwork has already been laid for edible landscaping in Singapore thanks to a 2009 city planning policy called LUSH, which stands for Landscaping for Urban Spaces and High Rises. It requires developers to incorporate greenery into their plans and has helped give rise to a massive landscaping industry in the city. In 2017, LUSH was updated to include a provision that allowed rooftop farms to count towards the required landscape replacement area of a building. Now, with the government's 30 by 30 push to produce more of its own food, urban farming is looking like it could have its own renaissance, building quite literally on top of the success of Lush. So Singapore is looking at a strategy of increasing production from that 1% of land uh, through technology approaches, uh, whether it's building vertical farms, factory indoor farms, uh, battery farm production systems for eggs, and intensive aquaculture systems. Right now, you're probably picturing something like this, and to some degree, you're right. Indoor farming is part of Singapore's plan. Artisan Green grows spinach in a controlled indoor environment using water instead of soil and pesticides. Everything from the light to the temperature can be optimised for the specific crops. Sky Greens uses hydraulic power to rotate and irrigate crops in modular vertical frames. The racks can be stacked up to 9 metres and housed in outdoor greenhouses. But while controlled environments can help avoid some of the pitfalls of traditional farming, like water pollution caused by pesticide runoff, the process can be quite energy intensive. And after labour, energy and technology costs, it can be hard for urban farmers to compete with the price of imports. 
we know that the food system is challenged because of the approaches of industrialized uh, production. By creating controlled environment agriculture, warehouses of uh, plant factories, for example, uh, we're falling back into the same space. So while, whilst we have that as one approach, uh, which is highly publicized and focused on, uh, we, we need alternative approach uh, to that. One alternative to growing crops inside buildings is to simply build farms on top of them. In partnership with the Singapore Food Agency, City Ponics opened a pilot commercial farm on the rooftop of a multi-storey car park, where it grows lettuce, spinach and basil, or basil if you're watching in the US, using its hydroponic vertical farming racks. And Edible Garden City has designed urban farms to live on top of shopping malls, car parks, and even in an unused outdoor jacuzzi. The government's making more space available for larger scale farms too. Since 2020, it's offered up to at least 16 car park rooftop sites to be rented out for three years as urban farms. In addition to contributing to the 30 by 30 goal, the government said urban farms can also help to cool the city through rooftop greenery. Design firms are also looking to the urban island as they think about the future of sustainable design. Gensler's come up with ideas to incorporate farming solutions into park benches, building facades and even ceilings. And Arab visited Singapore back in 2019 to explore the future of urban agriculture. But when it comes to urban farming, going from concept to construction is only half the battle. The biggest challenge of all may be getting people to actually eat the food, especially when it comes with a higher price tag. It really requires everyone uh, to participate in it, right? whether it is growing that um, leafy greens at home and understanding that process, um, or then starting community farms within you know, their HDB blocks to drive a community effort to food growing. Uh, I think that is, that is really important because we may never hit the 30 by 30 if we don't have a whole society approach uh, because industry can only do that much, government can only do that much. Um, so everyone needs to participate. Singapore isn't the first to turn to urban farming. In the 1990s, Cuba began building its own urban farming infrastructure out of necessity because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, which led the country to lose roughly half of its oil imports. And today, cities including Sao Paulo, Seoul and Tokyo all have their own urban farming initiatives. What makes Singapore unique is that it's essentially building an agriculture industry from the ground up. What if we can develop and maintain a purposeful landscape or, or edible landscape? And if we can start to build a landscape nutritional index, instead of how much greenery there is, we can start to count how much carbohydrates uh, there is in this given development, uh, how much protein are we producing from uh, the root vegetables or, or, or the moringa tree, the, the leaves are high in protein. Uh, it, it can become a latent food bank uh, to build a layer of resiliency uh, for the state. Uh, and that potentially can get us to hitting the 30% by, by 2030. Right now, Singapore is a kind of test case for modern day urban farming. If it takes off, then it could serve as a blueprint for how we build the food resilient cities of the future. But only if everyone gets on board. If this video is growing on you and you want to learn more about where construction is headed, make sure you're subscribed to Tomorrow's Build.